Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this first uh, lecture. Um, I would like to spend a couple of words about this initiative. First of all, uh, uh, my name is Fabrizio Granelli, and I'm a professor in uh, the University of Trento, and uh, I'm also the chair of the Italian chapter of Communication Society and Vehicular Technology Society. And together with uh, CNIT and GTTE, which are the two major associations in telecommunication research in Italy, uh, decided to organize uh, this event with uh, two different uh, goals. One is to bring uh, uh, services to our community. So we invited the top experts uh, in telecommunications to come uh, and present their uh, achievements and new ideas and on the other side we would like to solicit donations uh, to the civil protection in Italy since uh, in this in this dark period uh, we need uh, also some uh, some funding to to proceed and for this reason uh, in the website of the initiative you can find the IBAN information if you want to to do a donation so uh, today, we have the pleasure to host uh, uh, Jafar El Mirgani, uh, which will speak about uh, ICT sustainability. Uh, Jafar uh, is a very important uh, researcher in the field and uh, uh, he has a very long CV. Maybe Jafar later will tell something more, more detailed, but uh, what I wanted to outline is that uh, he, he was uh, Chair, the co-chair of the working group on wired core and access networks in the Green Touch initiative, which was a, a very big initiative from companies and research centers to address the problem of uh, power consumption in network and the internet. So without uh, uh, time, I think you are interested uh, more in, in the speaker words, uh, I, I will leave the floor to our speaker and so that then we can start. Uh, so let me change the speaker to Jafar. Okay, Jafar, now you are the presenter. You can share your slides. Okay, excellent. So I have just uh, shared the slide. Uh, can can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Um, um, you can put them in. Okay, now we're in presentation mode, so the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Fabrizio, for the uh, introduction and for this opportunity. And thanks everybody for joining, and uh, also for giving us this uh, opportunity to share with you, but also to try to contribute in a positive way. Um, so my name is uh, Jafar Al Mirgani. I'm from University of Leeds in the UK. And uh, as Fabrizio, Fabrizio introduced, I'm going to be talking about sustainable ICT. And uh, here I'll talk about two uh, important areas. One is greening ICT, making ICT uh, energy efficient, green, uh, reduces power consumption and so on. And this is one of the areas within sustainable ICT. And the other is greening by ICT, which means we use ICT in other areas to make them more efficient, whether these areas are manufacturing or transport or uh, other uh, areas, uh, smart cities and so on. Um, so I'll try to capture some of the research happening in these areas. Um, Fabrizio, as we go along, if uh, my voice uh, becomes interrupted or anything like that, uh, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, continue. Okay, um, so this is a, a little bit of uh, biography and background about me. I'll not talk a lot. Uh, hopefully the slides are going to be shared with you. Um, so I led uh, a project uh, called Intelligent Energy Aware Networks, uh, a six million pound project funded by our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council between 2010 and 2016, uh, focusing on energy efficiency. And also I contributed to the uh, Green Touch Initiative, whose goal was to improve energy efficiency by a factor of 1000. Uh, a lot of this work is now captured in IEEE standards. So I'll, I'm going to talk about some of those standards, five of those standards in particular, uh, 1925, 1926, up to 1929. I'm currently leading another big uh, project in uh, IEEE between 20, uh, in, uh, 
EPSRC between 2019 and 2024. And this looks at uh, 6G networks and uh, energy efficiency there is also uh, very uh, important. I have had about uh, 500 papers or just over uh, published in this area. So this is an outline of uh, the talk that I'm going to go uh, to give today. I'll talk about the need for sustainable ICT and uh, hopefully have try to motivate a lot of the work that has happened in the field over the past uh, almost decade. Um, I'll talk about uh, the program grant that we had, the Internet, the Energy, Intelligent Energy Aware Networks. I'll talk about Green Touch and the team very briefly. And uh, then I'll talk uh, for the majority of the time about um, what I refer to as case studies or techniques that can be used to improve energy efficiency in networks. So these are a range of measures. I'm going to talk about data centers and renewable energy. I'm going to talk about joint cloud and network virtualization uh, with the goal of improving their energy efficiency. I'll talk about how can we place content and migrate it and migrate virtual machines to improve energy efficiency. I'll talk about big data networks and uh, their role in improving energy efficiency. I'll talk about uh, networks inside data centers and uh, how we can improve energy efficiency here. I'll talk about IoT networks. Um, energy storage and blackouts is another very important area. Uh, the ability to store energy and to use it in a way that uh, efficiently uh, improves the reliability and availability of networks. And I'll do that also in cloud fog uh, networks. I'll then move on to talk a little bit about our testbed implementations to give you an idea about how many of the, how uh, many of those uh, ideas were captured, and then um, I'll talk. Uh, so these uh, topics here are all about uh, greening ICT, which is a lot of the effort that is happening. Then I'll talk about uh, greening by ICT, and in particular, I'll highlight some of the work that Jesse, the Global E Sustainability Initiative, is doing. And I'll talk also about the IEEE Sustainable ICT Initiative. This is an initiative that I co-chair, uh, whose role is to uh, uh, promote uh, greening by ICT, but also greening uh, ICT. And this is where many of the standards are placed. OK, so the need uh, for uh, sustainable ICT. So this is a, a, a chart that was uh, produced by uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the US. And what it shows are uh, on the left hand side here are all the sources of energy that we have all the way from solar uh, to here coal to natural gas to petroleum and so on. And the larger the size of the box here, that means we get more energy from those sources currently. On the right hand side, it shows uh, the uh, areas where we spend this energy, for example, in transportation, in industrial, in commercial and in residential. And you can see a lot of petroleum, for example, goes into transportation. Uh, what we see here is the total energy that is useful. And what we see here is the energy that we lose. And once you, uh, you do all the sums, you find that actually all over the world, we lose more energy than the energy we use. And therefore, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, need for energy efficiency. Our processes, whether they are uh, all, all of these different processes here, residential, commercial, um, uh, industrial, transportation, all of these need to be revisited with energy efficiency in mind. So I hope this uh, tells you that uh, energy efficiency is important. We are wasting a lot more than we are saving. And in fact, for those who follow sustainability, they will know that uh, currently we are living, or many countries uh, in the West at least, are living uh, at a standard uh, that requires four to five planet Earths to sustain it in terms of materials and so on. Now, in terms of where does this uh, map in, in terms of uh, ICT carbon footprint, for a long time, the largest single producer of uh, CO2 was the US until roughly around the year 2000 or just after that, it was overtaken by China. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the breakdown of this uh, uh, power consumption of ICT, so ICT currently has got a carbon footprint that is uh, comparable to the global aviation industry, which is about 2% of the uh, world uh, carbon footprint. However, unlike aviation, which is almost flat in, in terms of growth, uh, currently traffic in networks is growing at about 30 to 40% per year. 
The breakdown of these uh, power consumption elements uh, in terms of ICT, about 25% is attributed to telecom, about 18% to data centers, and about 57% uh, is attributable to uh, uh, preferred devices. In terms of uh, the telecom companies, the telecom companies in each of the countries, so for example in Italy, Telecom Italia, um, consume uh, a significant amount of energy in their country. So for Telecom Italia, for example, it's about 1%. British Telecom in the UK is about 0.7%, um, and, and similar NTT, 0.7%, and so on. So these telecom companies are currently the single largest user of energy in their respective countries. They use more energy than manufacturing manufacturing industry. British Telecom, for example, in the UK uses more power, uh, is the single largest user of energy in the UK, it uses more power than telecom, than uh, train companies and uh, manufacturing industry and so on. And uh, this tells us uh, that uh, we really need to focus into this area of ICT and try to improve its energy efficiency. One of the drivers is uh, the traffic that we have in the networks, and this is a chart that uh, we produced at the time uh, we're doing work in Green Touch. It shows the growth in traffic uh, versus uh, time. So actually, you, you may see that uh, the, uh, the traffic is uh, not uh, uh, growing, it's diminishing, but uh, this is just uh, in, in relation to what was happening uh, roughly just before the year 2000, where traffic was growing at about 300% per year. Obviously, people expected it to grow like that, and instead it uh, diminished in this way, and therefore roughly around 2000, we had the burst of the bubble. But uh, still, we are growing at about 30 to 40 percent per year. And what this means is if you have traffic that grows at 40 percent per year, then it doubles every two years. It multiplies by a factor of 30x in, in 10 years and by a factor of 1000x in 20 years. And therefore, from here came this 1000x factor that you keep seeing uh, in the telecom industry time and again. For example, uh, uh, when people try to talk about improving energy efficiency in new generations of wireless, of wired networks, and so on. So the idea is that if we were able to improve energy efficiency of networks by a factor of 1000, then in 20 years, we will consume the same amount of energy as we consume today while accommodating 1,000x more traffic. And this led uh, roughly in the year 2015 to the Green Touch uh, Consortium uh, formation, whose goal was not to improve energy efficiency by a factor of two or a factor of three, but uh, they came with a very bold factor saying we are going to try to find a way to improve energy efficiency of uh, telecom networks, of ICT, but in particular the communication part of it by a factor of 1,000. This effort was uh, led by Bell Labs. Uh, at the time it was uh, Alcatel-Lucent, uh, later it became Nokia. And uh, it was successful. It uh, continued for about five or six years. And uh, to understand which part of the network we need really to address to get this factor of 1,000, then we need to look at the traffic in the network. So this is a North America example, the traffic in terabit per second versus years. So the smallest by volume uh, is wireless uh, voice, and it is also the slowest growing. And uh, the fastest growing is wireless data. So that tells you most people now don't use their phone phones to talk, rather they use them uh, for internet and for video and, and other applications. The largest uh, by volume is internet video followed by peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you want to do anything to address energy efficiency, you have to address uh, those uh, segments, uh, especially internet video, peer-to-peer -peer, and uh, wireless data. And hopefully in this talk, you will see how we can try to improve the energy efficiency of each of those. So this was uh, the Green Touch uh, Consortium and its uh, final celebrations. We received a number of awards from that, but also uh, uh, the Green Touch Consortium produced a number of white papers. And hopefully once you have the slides, you will be able to uh, type those uh, names of uh, the uh, white papers into your browser and download copies if you wanted to. And they summarize a lot of the uh, work that was done and the uh, techniques that can be used uh, to achieve energy efficiency. So that is myself with uh, Terry Clean and uh, uh, Terry Van Langham from uh, um, uh, Bell Labs. Uh, 
uh, Green Touch. So this is um, uh, some of the uh, members of my team who have been working in this. So currently we are two academics, uh, five postdocs and 20 PhD students. Of those at this point in time, 11 work in energy efficiency and 18 completed their PhDs in different areas relating to energy efficiency over the past uh, five or eight years. Um, so I'll move on now to talk about uh, network energy efficiency and some of the case studies. So um, this was uh, some of the outputs from the uh, Intelligent Energy Aware Networks Internet uh, Program Grant. So there was a consideration of uh, better use of renewable energy in networks because we have got two different uh, requirements. One of them is to reduce the power consumption and uh, the goal there or the metric is to reduce the joules of energy that are used or uh, watts if you like, uh, but more uh, joules of energy uh, to do a particular amount of work and then and the other kind of uh, different uh, set of metrics that are used uh, are to reduce the amount of CO2 in the uh, in the planet and therefore um, having reduced the number of uh, or the amount of power that is consumed by networks if we're able to replace the non-renewable energy sources with renewable energy sources then we reduce uh, the carbon footprint of the network even further and this is very important because um, Ultimately, uh, that is what matters uh, in terms of global warming and, and other effects. But uh, also it comes with these challenges because every time we design the communication network, one of the assumptions we made was that the power supply is constant. It is not something that comes and goes and so on. So solar has got very slow variation, wind has got very high variation, and therefore there is a lot. there are lots of challenges in trying to uh, come up with the best way to deal with this renewable energy. Topology optimization, what would be the best uh, network topology that minimizes power consumption. So we produce proofs, for example, that the best uh, network topology that minimizes power consumption when all the users have got comparable amount of traffic to send is a full mesh. And uh, the network uh, topology that, that minimizes power consumption when there is one dominant user, uh, dominant by a big factor like a data center, then it is a star. Uh, content distribution, how many clouds should you build and where should you build them and so on. Uh, content caching is also very important. If you are a user connected to a router, you usually go uh, down the network and then up and get your video from a server far away and then come back again and consume it locally. That, that wastes a lot of power up and down the network. Alternatively, what you can do is you can cache content close by and therefore consume the video from nearby and that saves power. But it obviously adds a new component in the network, which is a content cache. And therefore, there is a trade-off between uh, adding those caches and the amount of power that they save you up and down the network. Uh, big data networks, I'm going to talk about this. We are measuring things everywhere and therefore we're generating huge amounts of data from IoT and other applications. And then vehicular networks and autonomous driving and so on, and we're seeing those having a, a large effect. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the first one here on data centers and uh, renewable energy. So what we have here is uh, we have a network that has got a physical layer here. The, in this case, it's a core network with an optical uh, uh, um, uh, set of fibers, amplifiers, uh, switches, and so on, an IP layer with IP routers, and so on, and a number of uh, data centers, and also renewable energy available in each of uh, or in some of those nodes. Uh, the ways you can uh, get from one node to the other is you start in the IP layer, you go down to the optical layer, maybe you stay in the optical layer until you reach the destination and then you exit. We call this bypass. Alternatively, you bypass the intermediate nodes. Alternatively, you go down to the optical layer and at every intermediate node, you go up to the IP layer and then come down to the optical layer and so on. And we call this non-bypass. In each of the areas, I list a number of papers here for those who are interested to find out uh, more. You can uh, get more information here. And this is the only time I think I'm just going to list uh, some mathematics. And the main reason here is just to tell you how these uh, problems are solved. How do we actually uh, try to improve energy efficiency? So it turns out that uh, improving energy efficiency in many cases is a, a problem in using uh, 
resources in the most optimum way, not wasting resources and uh, trying to share them and use them in an effective way. And that, and that also turns out to be an optimization problem. So you would want to optimize the use of the uh, routers, the switches, the amplifiers, uh, the base stations, and, and so on in the most effective way. So therefore, we form formulate the problem as an optimization problem. In this case, we use mixed integer linear programming optimization. And you try to capture um, uh, an objective function that may be, for example, the total power consumption that you have. This is power consumption of root pores that, uh, that they are, are the high-speed pores. This is the power consumption of the aggregation pores of the routers, the transponders power consumption, the amplifiers power consumption, the optical switches, the multiplexers and demultiplexers. And then you say that this uh, optimization has got to be so subject to constraints and there are many, many. I just uh, pick two here, which basically uh, are things that relate to traffic. So traffic leaving a, a node minus traffic entering the node is equal to the traffic that originates in the node if this is the source node is equal to the negative of that if the traffic is exiting and this is a destination node and is equal to zero for all intermediate nodes and you, you can do things for download traffic for upload traffic so in essence you try to tell the optimization you have to minimize power consumption but at the same time you have to serve the traffic um, uh, so this is a flavor of what you need to do. Uh, other than this, uh, I will mainly be uh, describing the problems and uh, the results that we get. So here is a situation in which we had um, a network uh, across uh, the US uh, and uh, we have uh, three different uh, wind farms uh, located at these uh, locations here. And the question was, where should we place data centers? So you have got two options when you want to place data centers. Either you can place data centers uh, in cities uh, next to population centers, in which case you have a very short route uh, from the consumer to the data center because the data center is in the same city where you are, in Leeds or uh, in Milan or wherever you are. And, um, uh, and therefore you lose very little amount of uh, power in the communication network to reach your data center. On the other hand, uh, this, uh, the renewable energy that is available to you is usually somewhere far away, near a hydroelectric dam, in a hydroelectric dam, or maybe in a wind farm in the countryside. And therefore that renewable energy has to be transmitted to your data center. And we refer to this as uh, energy to bits. You move the energy to where the bits are, in which case you lose about 15% of your total power every 1,000 kilometers, and this is in the electrical transmission lines. Alternatively, what you can do is you can place your data centers next to the renewable energy sources, so next to hydroelectric dams, next to uh, uh, wind farms, and so on. And in this case, uh, you're not going to lose power in the electrical transmission lines because your, your data center is next to the uh, power plant. But uh, what will happen is you can lose power in the communication network in going to the data center. And in this case, we move the bits to where the energy is. We move the data uh, from the cities to where the hydroelectric dam is, and we refer to this as bits to energy. So the question that we ask here within Green Touch is, uh, is it going to be energy to bits or bits to energy? Should we move the bits of information to where the energy is, or should we move the energy to where the bits are? And this is a question in which one loses more, electrical transmission lines or communication networks. Uh, in moving, uh, either move the energy or move the bits. And uh, therefore, this was uh, formulated as optimization. And uh, the answer in the end uh, turned out to be that we should actually place uh, the data centers next to the wind farms. So for example, data centers uh, four and five, we had uh, 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 five of them, uh, were placed uh, next to this uh, wind farm, uh, wind farm one. And the data centers six and seven were placed uh, next to wind farm two. And and uh, data center eight was placed next to wind farm three. So the answer is that actually communication networks lose less energy than electrical transmission lines. And therefore, this was one of the first uh, kind of uh, demonstrations or proofs that it is actually better to build these large facilities next 
to where energy is and you will lose less in moving the bits to where the energy is uh, rather than moving the energy to where the bits are but obviously you have to be aware of delay and so on and this is obviously what caused later on people to start looking at introducing fog and edge processing and things closer to the consumer but it is still a good idea to place these large facilities next to where you have uh, renewable energy I'll move on to talk now about a second case study, which is uh, about uh, network uh, clouds and uh, network virtualization. So this is a network, and this may be a network uh, across a country, and you have a number of virtual network requests. So uh, these are represented by uh, the diagrams that we have here. So, for example, uh, the red dots here represent uh, uh, nodes that have got communication, but uh, uh, also nodes that have got uh, uh, processing requirements. And uh, the idea is that uh, either this is a network, for example, that is owned by a large operator, uh, a countrywide operator, a BT or an AT&T or something like that. And these are smaller operators or enterprises that want a slice of this network for their requirements. Or alternatively, these may be a, a virtual requests within the uh, big network itself. And the idea is to be able to take those virtual requests and place them in the actual network. And this is called embedding. So you embed the virtual request into the substrate network, which is the physical network itself. And uh, there are many ways that you can do this. Uh, so, for example, uh, this is one particular way uh, where you place the nodes in particular physical nodes and then you interconnect them by links, uh, by routing information, for example, from this node to that node. And uh, these uh, placements uh, uh, may follow certain rules. So, for example, a user may say, I want one of the nodes to be in my city because this is where my headquarter is and I want to connect to other cities. Alternative Alternatively, they may have other requirements where, for example, they may uh, want one uh, node here, but they don't care where the other nodes are, etc. And therefore, uh, the other request may be embedded here, and the third request uh, may be embedded in this way. And as you can see, there are many different ways of uh, doing those embeddings, and the question or the point that we addressed here is how can you do this in an energy efficient way? So this here is, again, a physical network with uh, uh, some physical resources at uh, the uh, physical layer and uh, some IP uh, uh, layer. Um, uh, can I just uh, pause for one minute and I'll just ask uh, Fabrizio if uh, my voice and uh, uh, pace is uh, clear to everyone? Yes, I can. Well, thank you. Good, thank you. So uh, in this case, what we have is uh, we have a number of requests here. So this uh, particular one um, it has got uh, those uh, three nodes and they are embedded in this particular way. Uh, we have got uh, the three here and they are embedded in a different way. And uh, the goal is to do this embedding in a way that minimizes power consumption. And uh, here is a set of results that shows that uh, th this is what happens in the network power consumption. This is what happens in the uh, data centers power consumption. And this is what happens in the total uh, power consumption. This is the number of requests that we have in the previous example. We only saw three requests. So here we're going up to 50 requests. And uh, e eventually, if you were to do it in a way that uh, is done currently, which is just minim uh, uh, achieve uh, all the requests, embed all the requests, in a way that minimizes the cost of the network, which is what is currently done by operators, versus doing it in a way that minimizes energy uh, consumption, we can save up to 60% power consumption. And the intuition behind that is that many of those uh, requests can be placed close to each other, and therefore you uh, have shorter spans in the network to get to the next node. Also, you can start doing uh, the equivalent of uh, bin packing. So you try to fill up servers before you start a new server, and so on. And that way, uh, you can improve energy efficiency even more. I'll uh, move on to talk about uh, VM placement and migration. So this is another area that is also of uh, uh, great interest uh, currently, um, where we have got, uh, in this example, uh, a network architecture that includes uh, uh, devices at the edge of the network that include access network and access network, for example, a passive optical network in this case, that include uh, processing at the edge of the network. So this is uh, access fog. Uh, so 
so this is edge processing it has got also processing nodes in the metro layer uh, metro fog and it has got the conventional clouds in the core of the network so these would be the clouds where you store most of your data and uh, in addition if you want to do some uh, processing in this network then you do it in a virtual machine for example and those virtual machines may either need to cooperate with each other to do uh, the uh, uh, processing that you have asked or may need to synchronize with each other so for example if you update your uh, web page uh, uh, at one location then the virtual machines will need to update or maybe if they are doing a computational problem they need to synchronize with each other and uh, the, the, the basic idea is that um, if we were to place uh, the processing in the access uh, layer, in the access fog, for example, here at the OLT in the telecom office in your city, then you have very short journey to where your data is being processed and you see very uh, small delay. And this is very good in factories, in automation, in uh, uh, autonomous driving and so on. The downside usually to these kind of approaches is that the type of uh, servers and so on that you can accommodate date in the access fog tend to be fewer and also less energy efficient than the big ones that you can do in the cloud and therefore you can actually go longer distances and get to a very good server here or alternatively maybe shorter distances and uh, get uh, servers that may not be top of the range at uh, the access layer or the metro uh, layer and in any case their number is limited and therefore you need to optimize and see what would be the best place to meet your delay requirements but also many my spark consumption and the main idea is that if we are able to achieve a, a power proportional computing that means if the power consumption of our servers increases linearly with the type of work that we put in the server then it is a very good idea to uh, do most of the processing in the edge of the network that means it becomes very good to do uh, processing here in the access once it is full you go to the metro and finally you go to the uh, core uh, network if on the other hand and making copies of uh, the virtual machines is going to double, triple, etc. your power, you may as well uh, place them somewhere central because every time you place things in a central location like in a big data center somewhere here, everybody can share them from all parts of the network and that sharing improves energy efficiency. So there is that trade-off that you need to be uh, aware of. If uh, things uh, uh, can be shared in a better way, then maybe you place them central if you are not worried about delay. If you uh, are worried about delay and uh, you can get to a situation where uh, increasing the load increases the power consumption uh, in a proportional way then you uh, place them at the edge and uh, the reason I say it in a proportional way is that if you uh, have done this experiment with your computer and if you switch it on it may consume for example 250 watts your uh, desktop and uh, if you put the maximum uh, processing on it it may only consume 300 watts so we have very high idle power in many of these machines and therefore uh, we need to be aware of those factors but there are ways of improving energy efficiency and in all cases I kind of uh, give some details here of uh, uh, further references. Another uh, case study that I'll talk about is um, uh, network virtualization and energy efficiency so this is a kind of a 4G, 5G uh, kind of uh, setting where uh, we have uh, is closer to the 5G end of things uh, where we have um, remote radio heads so the base stations are replaced by very simple uh, remote radio heads and that are connected to uh, maybe a, a passive optical network that supports them uh, so ONUs, optical network units and OLT and uh, then there is a core network and you try to abstract the main functions that you need to have you may have a, a, a baseband uh, processing unit a BBU uh, a set of virtual machines and these would be the ones that do the modulation the coding and the signal processing most probably you want to place those very close to the remote radio head there are ones that uh, move or change a bit slower like mobility management uh, people and entities move at the millisecond maybe range and therefore these can be a bit further out uh, you have things like uh, policy control and rule functions and so on and these uh, are uh, things that would tell uh, the operator whether this person 
person is allowed to do that call, etc., and uh, what are their uh, details. And uh, these would can be even placed in the core network because uh, you need to interact with them less. Uh, and then there are the uh, packet gateway and the uh, switching uh, gateways. And uh, the question is, once you put all of these, your BBU, your home subscriber serv services, and your policy control and rule functions, your mobility management entity, and the different gateways, the question is, where would you implement those in your network in a way that minimizes uh, power consumption and also gives them the kind of latency that uh, they require? Uh, here is an example where no virtualization was done and the load is increased. And here is a case where we do virtualization and sharing uh, things in the network and we get improvement in energy consumption. On top of that, there may be also uh, benefits that people can gain by doing content caching because if you look at uh, something like YouTube for example they may be 100 million 500 million videos but uh, only about 50 or 80 of those videos are the very popular videos and when you open YouTube you see those are the top videos and those uh, maybe 50 or 100 videos account for about 80 percent usually of the requests uh, what is referred to as a ZIF distribution or a heavy tail distribution so about only 100 or, or, or so of those videos give you 80% success or hit ratio or uh, account for about 80% of all the requests. So if I was to make copies uh, in caches and place caches in different uh, locations in the network close to the end user, then I can have very small caches because you only need to accommodate 50 or 80 videos, but 80% of the traffic will then be served locally. And uh, this comes because video is not equally popular. That's the main reason that uh, there are some videos that are very popular that everybody wants to watch and you bring those closer to people. And if you do that, you get uh, quite a significant uh, amount of uh, power saving by reducing the traffic in the uh, actual network itself. I'll talk about uh, uh, big data networks and this is the next area. So big data networks, um, so if you look at uh, the sources of data that we have, we have financial data, we have social media, we have healthcare data like uh, we do now uh, quite a lot. And uh, this data uh, uh, needs to be sent to data centers uh, for processing. So this is what is done in a conventional way. You have the sources of data, you send them to a data center, they get processed and then uh, the result is sent to the uh, people who are interested in the outcomes. Now, an example, for example, is a heart rate monitor. So if you have a heart rate monitor, the waveform is measured and then may be sent to a data center. The data center processes this and if there is any abnormality, then they may contact the doctor or the people or the health healthcare provider. Now, if you look at that, the, the uh, waveform is quite large and hopefully this health uh, monitor or heart rate monitor will be sending data for the next maybe 30, 40 years and will just be saying this person is fine, is fine is fine. So there was no point in sending all these huge chunks of data to the data center uh, to be processed there. In fact, you could have just uh, uh, processed the data locally and sent the outcome that the person is fine. In other words, these networks now transmit data, not knowledge. And what we are interested in is knowledge and not data. So what you want to do is you want to ensure that your network carries knowledge, does not carry data. So uh, because then you can reduce the volume uh, that you send in the network. So here is an example uh, where, for example, we produce uh, uh, some data, uh, we process it uh, uh, locally, and uh, this local uh, processing entity does not have enough capability to process everything. So it was given three big chunks of data. It was uh, able to, pro to process one of them, two were not uh, processed. We come to the next node here, and now this has got enough capability. It, uh, uh, the, the one that was processed uh, goes through. The two that were not processed now become processed. And now we started here with huge amount of data. By the time we reach here, we have little uh, amount of data, which is information or knowledge. And this is what gets sent to the data, so to the data center. So the data center will be told, for example, this person is fine, and therefore just the health record is updated, or is told this is 
is an emergency and therefore a, a message is sent to an ambulance to come uh, to attend to the person. And uh, these kind of networks we refer to as big data networks, but also as tapered networks. Tapering is uh, reducing the size and therefore they start at uh, with a very large uh, size of network. And as you go to the center of the network, they become smaller. And by doing this edge processing, we can save up to about 76% we have shown uh, in terms of uh, total power consumption in the network. I'll talk uh, about uh, another case study here, uh, six, uh, and this is about data center disaggregation and virtualization. So currently, as you know, there is uh, one box is, that is supposed to fit all sizes, which is called our uh, computer or our server. The servers are identical. If you look at the PC that you have in the office, all of them are the same. It is a box that has got uh, one processor, has got a, a hard disk, has got a certain amount of RAM, has got a certain uh, input output. So this is a different uh, approach called disaggregation that was uh, pioneered by Intel, uh, which says basically let us uh, um, look at this problem a bit more carefully and uh, not all processing jobs require, require the same amount of resources. So why not uh, separate uh, instead of uh, the usual approach where each rack has got many servers, why not make the racks uh, specialized? So one rack only has got, uh, for example, processors, one rack has only got memory, and one rack has only got input-output cards. And therefore, for the particular problem that you are solving currently or processing, you may require four CPUs, a huge amount of memory, and five, for example, network interface cards. So you make a virtual server, and you keep it there for one hour that has got not one processor, but four processors, enough memory, enough input-output cards, and uh, at the end of the uh, uh, period, you disintegrate it. On the other hand, you may have a situation where you require very little processing, but a lot of input-output, and therefore you make a different type of server that has only got one processor, but maybe has got three or four different input-output cards. And this was prompted because you have situations in which, for example, uh, you may give a, a very difficult problem to a CPU. The CPU is working and working, the input output output card is start doing nothing. In other cases, you may have situations where you're streaming, uh, for example, video. The input output card is very busy, but the processor is doing very little. And therefore, this uh, concept of uh, making servers on the fly or virtualizing and composing servers when you need them with the correct size is the concept of disaggregation. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, energy efficiency many times is about using resources in the best uh, way possible. So what is done here is to come up with an architecture that uh, has got uh, the input output cards, the CPU rack, has got the RAM card, and they are interconnected using an optical network. And then uh, we compose those uh, on the fly to the size we need. And if this is done in an efficient way, uh, you can save uh, energy uh, uh, up to about 60%, but it can be as low as 10%. Uh, it can be very low if your uh, requests are mostly uh, processor intensive. So if most of the things you want to do are very computationally uh, demanding, there isn't something a lot better than just the standard box. If you have things that have got a lot of input output and so on, you can do better and things that require more memory. But in generally you gain by uh, composing things with the correct size that you need. I'll talk about uh, IoT uh, service embedding. Uh, so uh, this is a, another area that is uh, growing uh, within the IoT area. So this is a kind of a smart city setting where we have a number of sensors and IoT devices in different areas. And we have this concept of business processes. So these business processes are things that are composed on the fly uh, when they are required to uh, give a particular uh, uh, business function. So for example, we may have a security uh, service uh, being a uh, business process and this security service may say ah, for this particular point in time I'm interested in uh, having access to some motion detectors in this zone I'm interested in having uh, access to some RFIDs in a particular zone. And I have a request for display screens and alarms in a different zone. And uh, this uh, uh, virtualization or embedding uh, uh, then uh, helps uh, the person who is interested in security services to compose for them the network they need with the components they need 
on the fly, maybe in in few minutes or in a minute or two, uh, so that now they have sensing in that region. They have actuation in this region, meaning they have put a fire alarm here. They measure things here and they displayed things elsewhere in the city. You can have some energy saving services, so you may have uh, a building that is not being used, etc. Uh, at a, a given point in time, so you have motion detection, you have temperature sensors, and you make a business process. You may have a fire a fire protection service, so therefore you may have uh, temperature sensors, smoke detectors, uh, water sprinklers, alarms, and so on. Now, obviously, you can say I can make those uh, static at any point in time. Why do I need to compose them on the fly? The idea is that uh, you can have generic sensors uh, distributed in different parts of the city uh, that can be used for multiple things. So a motion detector may be used uh, for security, may be used for fire protection, may be even used uh, when you're doing some administration services. Similarly, a display may be used for many things, and therefore you do not make things that are rigid. You make them on the fly at the time you need them. If you see something suspicious happening here, then you get uh, more sensors and get access to them at that particular point in time. And the idea is to be able to do this in a kind of an automated way and on the fly and also in an energy efficient way. And if you were to do that um, here, you can, these are the conventional ways of uh, composing things and making them static. And here are uh, the kind of more energy efficient uh, ways that we do. Uh, this is pre-provisioning and this is sequential and you can save quite a lot of uh, energy. Sometimes sequential fails because you make decisions and you regret that you have made them so sequential always is about regretting the past, uh, whereas the kind of pre-provisioning and seeing uh, everything uh, in one go gives you the best results. I'll talk about, uh, I think, two more uh, case studies and then uh, we'll move to another topic. So this is about energy storage and blackout. So we did this over Telecom Italia uh, network and uh, I'm happy today I'm talking to uh, people uh, in Italy. Um, so this is, um, uh, the traffic uh, that goes in the network. Uh, this is renewable energy, solar energy, peak, middle of the day, uh, small at other parts of the day. And the idea is that you can have failures. Uh, so in a given city, for example, uh, node 14 here or uh, another node may have a failure and uh, uh, due to say power outage or some other uh, reason. And what we want to do is we want to have two things. We ha have access to renewable energy. We have access to energy storage, meaning batteries, and we want to uh, try to maintain this network operation despite this failure. So these are the different amounts of traffic, uh, low at night and high during the day in the different nodes. And uh, here are two different approaches to doing it. One of them is you say, okay, I'm going to store energy in the battery. And as soon as uh, things go down, I start using my battery. And uh, what you see, if you do that, this is the uh, time of day, and this is the amount of uh, power. As soon as you just rely on batteries only, you drain them very quickly. And then you have nothing until the sun rises and you start having having renewable energy here, solar. Obviously, if you have wind, you could have continued. And then when the sun sets, yeah, you, you again have uh, nothing. And therefore, if you look at the blocking, the blocking probability becomes very high during this time and during this time here. Alternatively, what you can do is you can add additional measures. I'm going to use my battery, but I'm also going to route traffic away from that node that has failed, in which case you do not uh, overuse your battery and you maintain the power and you use the renewable energy as far as possible. And your blocking probability here becomes uh, much lower. So the idea here is that there is a lot you can do in terms of uh, making use of uh, energy storage and uh, renewable energy in a more intelligent way than just relying on the batteries when the power goes out. Um, here is another example where we do something similar, but now including uh, the fog layer. Uh, so we have solar and uh, energy storage in the fog. We have uh, the core of the network, we have the edge, and uh, we have the OLTs, and here we have the end users, and this is our traffic. And we have this concept of uh, PUE, which is the power usage uh, effectiveness of the network. 
And uh, this, this is the total amount of power that is used by a node uh, divided by the power that is needed for just uh, the communication and computing. And usually when you say PUE is equal to 1.25, that means we require 1.25 times the uh, communication and uh, computing power. And the extra power is used for cooling, uh, air conditioning, lighting, and things like that. So if you have uh, data centers and fog with a high PUE, then you hardly use them and you end up going to the cloud. If you have things uh, with the, or the edge of the network with a very small PUE, 1.1, 1.1 is among the best that you can get now, and usually you only get them in very big data centers. Uh, telecom uh, facilities and so on have a PUE, sometimes that approaches two. But if you can get it as low as uh, this uh, 1.1, then you start uh, seeing that the fog layer becomes very good and you start uh, processing there. And here is an example also with uh, more energy storage. If you have energy storage, then you start using uh, the edge uh, layer uh, even more. I'll talk a little bit about now some test bed implementations. So this is our lab. Um, so the lab in my group uh, in the university, we have got a number of core nodes. Uh, we have got three nodes uh, here. Each of them has got uh, multiple hundred gigabit per second wavelengths, uh, uh, 10 or so, 10 gigabit uh, wavelengths and uh, many one gigabit wavelengths. We've got about 400 kilometers of fiber. And uh, we have is set up also as a data center. We have got 10 racks of uh, servers. We have got servers at the edge of the network. So you may have video here, it gets fed into to edge uh, processing and then out of this gets transmitted to a core node and goes through other core nodes in the country and then comes and gets edge processed at the other end. Uh, we implement a lot of the things that we have in net FPGAs. These are field programmable gate arrays uh, with the network capability 10 and 25 gigabit per second per uh, slot. It has got four slots and uh, therefore we're able to emulate a number of things. So here is an example where you have got some wireless connections you have got residential, you have got industrial, and you have got your core and metro uh, network. We have got uh, OLTs and ONUs, and, uh, and therefore uh, you can think of an example where um, video gets fed into a processing node uh, at the edge to extract some features for virtual reality, for example. Then this gets transmitted over a network and then gets processed at the other end and then gets uh, displayed. At the same time, we're able to move processing capability. So if, for example, this cell becomes very congested, many users are here, and this cell doesn't have many uh, users, then we do not only move bandwidths as people do, but we also move the processing capability between one cell and the next cell. And we can show this obviously experimentally. So we end up doing uh, kind of uh, analytic work, some simulations, and also some experimental demonstration. So this is an example of uh, kind of a demonstration that includes includes uh, the edge of the network, uh, the ONU, some processing uh, at the edge of the network, uh, fog units here with processing cells, uh, uh, processing also at the telecom office, uh, at the OLTs, and uh, here in the core network. And we look at things like power consumption and latency and, and so on, and try to achieve sub uh, one millisecond latency for the network. So those measures that uh, were done uh, during the time of uh, Green Touch and were captured, here is an example of uh, how much uh, uh, or, or what contributed what towards that 1,000 uh, factor of energy efficiency improvement that I mentioned. I talked about a number of techniques, and here we try to bring them together. So the network has got, uh, as you would uh, see here, has got many components, has got the wireless part of the network, has got the access part of the network, and has got the core part of the network. So what I'm presenting here is the core part of the network, and this is the part of the network that I was uh, responsible for during the Green Touch initiative. And uh, the overall goal was to improve the energy efficiency by a factor of 1,000. The core network had to do a, a factor of 100, roughly. We achieved a factor of 316x uh, improvement in energy efficiency. Now, how did we get this 316x uh, efficiency improvement? There was not one single thing that was 
was uh, the dominant that uh, you can do and everything becomes good. There are many small things that you can improve. So you get improvement from more slow business as usual uh, here in this case about 8% per year and that is a factor of four. There were a number of uh, uh, equipment improvements introduced uh, by us during Green Touch. So optical interconnects for example, optimizing the packet processing in routers, link optimized signal processing in transponders. This gave a factor of 4.7. The, uh, uh, the uh, management and protection of equipment, you usually uh, leave the uh, protection route on all the time. If you don't do that, then you uh, switch it, uh, power it down until you need it. So you get an improvement in energy efficiency. You bypass the routers, which are the most energy consuming parts. You use the right combination of uh, wavelengths and data rates. You uh, optimize the topology, and I talked about that. You do all these different techniques that we did in uh, virtualization and placement of content. And when you multiply those uh, factors and you look at uh, the network, uh, we get this 316x gain. So in 2010, our uh, average uh, uh, energy efficiency was about 360 nanojoules per bit. And this uh, number now uh, in, in 2020, we are getting to closer to the one nanojoule per bit in the uh, core of the network. So people in the um, uh, wireless will be familiar with maybe micro microjoules and so on. I'll talk about uh, greening uh, by ICT and the role of uh, Jesse. So Jesse is the global uh, enabling sustainability initiative called used to be called Global E Sustainability Initiative, and uh, it has got a number of uh, uh, partners here. I did not show the Green Touch partners, but Green Touch had about 50 member organizations. These are the member organizations of uh, Jesse, and uh, you'd see that they include a number of the kind of telecom operators that you are familiar with. Um, uh, I, even IEEE here, but also a number of energy and other uh, companies. Um, Jesse produces two reports that are very, uh, or one report, uh, but different versions of this report that uh, is very famous, and it's called the SMART uh, report. So the first time they produced it was in 2008, and it was called SMART 2020. They updated it in 2012, and they called it SMARTER 2020, and their latest version in 2015 or 2016 was called SMARTER 2030. Basically, what they did is they looked at what is the uh, carbon footprint of ICT, and they found at that time that it was about 1.4 or 1.43 uh, in this case of the global uh, carbon footprint of the world. But they found that also by using ICT in a good way in manufacturing, in agriculture, in transport and so on, you can make processes more efficient and therefore reduce the carbon footprint of other areas. And you can reduce the carbon footprint of other areas by uh, this 7.8%. And therefore uh, ICT has got the capability to reduce the global carbon footprint by a factor about 5.5 times its own carbon footprint. In 2012, they revised this number to 7.2. So this was as, as a result of uh, ICT becoming more efficient itself. So from 1.43, it became 1.27 of the global carbon footprint. And also by people now using ICT even more and more in manufacturing, uh, agriculture, transport, and other areas. Your buses may be ICT enabled, etc. cetera. Uh, and in, in Smarter 2013, 2016 or so, they start, they revised this to about a factor of approximately 10. And this is our best estimate now that ICT, uh, meaning communication networks, data centers, and so on, although they consume a lot of power, but they have the potential of reducing the carbon footprint in the rest of the world by a factor uh, that is equal to 10 times their own carbon footprint, which is quite significant. How do they do this? I'll just highlight uh, some of the areas. Uh, so uh, in mobility, in uh, manufacturing, in agriculture, in buildings, in energy, and the total ICT enabled saving is about uh, 12%. Uh, so you can see in health, uh, wearable devices, uh, e-learning, now many people are at home and we're using Teams and uh, uh, WebEx and other things uh, for learning. Uh, smart energy, uh, being able to control these uh, renewable energy sources in a better way, smart homes, uh, smart agriculture. Uh, smart logistics, uh, tracking trucks and selecting the best routes for them, etc. E-work uh, e and smart manufacturing. So all of these are areas where improvement can happen. 
I do not uh, plan to go through uh, all the details here, but you can see uh, different areas in smart buildings where you can improve energy resources, you can improve uh, processes, you can improve uh, the living. In smart agriculture, you can have uh, precision agriculture, you can have uh, uh, better farming techniques, better use of water, better use of fertilizers, and so on. Um, in uh, uh, in uh, logistics and uh, mobility, uh, we have uh, the better broadbands enable people to work remotely and from home, but also uh, we have better uh, control of our grid, so the smart grid and the energy storage and so on. And uh, each of these areas has have got a large section within that Smarter 2030 report that tell you how those numbers were estimated. Uh, here is uh, sustainability through ICT, the smart manufacturing. Uh, so things about uh, cyber physical systems, better control, IoT, uh, 3D printing, uh, drones, and uh, 3D printing now is becoming very important and networking it and being able to just download some files for a component, uh, a face mask uh, or valve or something like that and manufacture it on the fly. This is enabled by having these ICTs and people being able to share things at at those uh, global scales. I'll talk a little bit about the IEEE uh, uh, sustainability initiative. So following Green Touch, we formed this uh, IEEE uh, uh, sustainable ICT initiative, and its goal is to build uh, a holistic approach to sustainable uh, ICT, uh, to develop standards, conferences and events, publications and education. So for example, we developed new, uh, nine new standards um, uh, in, in, in IEEE. Uh, we uh, have got a number of white papers, we've got a number of short courses. Uh, Fabrizio and I uh, led a lot of the activities within this uh, green ICT area, so he, he would uh, be able to say even uh, more on these. Um, we have uh, uh, a lot of um, visibility for uh, green ICT as a result of sustainable ICT by holding events and uh, talking to different uh, uh, sectors and Jesse in collaboration between uh, society and companies and IEEE and technical areas. Um, uh, we established uh, tracks and events at conferences such as uh, Globcom and ICC, uh, expert panels. We had a summit, uh, the first uh, greening through ICT summit of the IEEE in 2017, and we had one also last year uh, in uh, Montreal, a sustainable ICT summit. Those are uh, nine different uh, standards. I'll not go through them in detail, but they look at different parts of the telecom uh, network. Uh, some look at emissions, uh, some look at uh, migrating virtual uh, machines as a result of uh, uh, wanting to reduce emissions. Some uh, look here at uh, designing uh, the uh, digital hardware, uh, the computing hardware in a more energy efficient way. Uh, some look at dynamic line rates uh, from Green Touch. Uh, the big data processing that I talked about is captured here. The virtualization and data centers are captured here. I talked also about energy efficient virtual machine placements. They are captured here. And the energy efficient content distribution is captured in 1929. Um, so the IEEE Institute wrote a number of articles about us. There has been a few things, quite a number of things in the general um, uh, industrial literature. Uh, also, uh, a number of special issues of uh, the IEEE, um, and we introduced uh, a new IEEE transactions, so a new journal of the IEEE uh, transactions on green communications and networking in 2017. So there is now a forum, not only quality uh, journals, proper uh, IEEE transactions, to capture many of those uh, developments that are happening. We contributed to things like IEEE Technology Time Machine, which uh, looks at forward into what uh, the world is going to look like uh, in, few, in a number of years. And um, there are a number of webinars and uh, short courses and tutorials. The sustainable ICT community of the IEEE has got about 5,000 members now. And obviously, you are welcome uh, to join. If you just go to IEEE and search for uh, sustainable ICT, you will find it there. So finally, I'll just uh, stop and uh, show this uh, figure here that uh, hopefully uh, captures a lot of uh, what has been achieved in greening uh, ICT. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me and uh, for uh, offering me this opportunity to talk to you. And I'll hand over uh, to Fabrizio now. Thank you.